Our next talk will be about how to protect Risk Five against side channel attacks. I will go through the whole story, like why we decided this was necessary, as well as what we did and um, how we tested it. So I hope I can do it in the allotted time. Uh, for the ones who are not really familiar with side channel analysis, um, I'm gonna briefly explain what it's about. So basically, um, a processor will consume different amount of power when a transistor is open or closed, or when uh, a register has to save uh, store a certain bit, it will consume a different amount of power when it has to store a one or a zero. Um, and if we continue that reasoning, it means that if different values are being processed by a processor, it will consume a different amount of power. Now, if you um, look at in the scenario of a cryptographic <laughs> implementation, the intermediate values that are being processed during that implementation are depending on the secret. So if our power consumption tells something about the intermediate values which are being processed, that means that I can, if I have the necessary tool set or the um, tool set for this, I can actually use these power consumption measurements to extract information about the key, thereby breaking the cryptographic implementation. So this is what side channel analysis is um, all about. So uh, in side channel analysis, the goal is to use measurable physical, uh, physical properties of a chip during the execution of an operation to extract secret information that's being used on the chip. And this can be power consumption or electromagnetic radiation. We were, uh, the, uh, you talked about timing earlier. So these are all measurable physical properties that can be used to extract secrets. Now, I'm not really going to talk about the timing that much. Um, I'm more going to talk about the data dependent uh, power consumption, where you need more, a lot of traces to extract uh, secrets. And this problem had been discovered at the end of the 90s, which means there is already 20 years of research going on. And of course, there is a, a lot of papers being written and uh, a lot of countermeasures have been published. One of the state-of-the-art countermeasures is based on Boolean masking, whereby you have a uh, value x, which you are going to represent, for example, as a tuple of two values, of which one is random, and the other one, um, if you XOR the two values together, it becomes the, the real secret. And because one of them was random, if you calculate with the value as being the tuple, and you change your algorithms to deal with these, uh, this representation, then all the intermediate values will be, be statistically independent of that secret and uh, your power consumption will not be related to the secret value anymore. So that's the idea behind the countermeasures. So why am I still here if there's 20 uh, years of research and there's countermeasures out there? Well, imagine I'm a software implementer and I'm going to implement these, these algorithms, these um, with, our, with countermeasures in it on a processor. Well, let's, let's look at what the processor does uh, for the software implementer. Uh, these intermediate values, where are they being used? At first, you have the register bank, obviously, because you're gonna store those values there. You have your LU, where you're going to do computations on those values. Uh, you're gonna use the memory. Um, so you're gonna store these intermediate values in the memory. And then the first, maybe, block, which is not that, um, not that obvious to a software developer is you have the memory interface. The values are going to go through that memory interface and as a software developer, you're not necessarily thinking about that. Um, if, if you look at how an, EL, an ALU can be implemented, there, might, there may be input registers to the ALU and there may be an output register at the end of the ALU. Also, again, as a software developer, you have no control over those. They're, they're given to you, they're part of the microarchitecture. There may be a forwarding register somewhere in that uh, CPU. Again, for, uh, the software implementer is obli oblivious on that. There is a, a cache, which you sort of know, but you have no control over, or very little. There is a branch prediction unit, um, a fetch decode unit, and there is also a JTAG or a debug interface. And all these blocks, they can all contain these intermediate values you're working with. On top of that, all these blocks have to be connected. So there's a bunch of interconnects and there is a bunch of paths between those blocks, also, which also are going to carry these values and these values are possibly going to interact with each other and therefore consuming power, which depends on these 
on these values. To continue the story, I need to tell a little bit more about how the power consumption is related to the actual values. And there is a couple type of leaks we distinguish. So either the power consumption is going to be related to the direct value of what is being computed. So you have the values which are, um, if you write down the algorithm, you have your intermediate values. And that, for example, a register writing or a value going over a bus, those are all direct values that are going to be carried. There are also data overwrite values. So if I write a value in a register and I'm overwriting that register, only a certain amount of bits will change. Therefore, the power consumption will be related to the amount of bits that will change or to the exact bits that will change. And that can also be depending on the, the actual values that are being written there. And then you have, even at a lower level, you have wire interconnects. Like, for example, if you have a register bank and the way the register bank is connected, like at a, at a lower level, you have, you may, maybe you read, you have a row read and a, and a column read, values in those may, um, there may be some leaks there because of the way everything's wired up. There are going to be glitches in the underlying hardware and those can also create a temporary power consumption which relates to the uh, glitch that's being shown at that point in time. So with all that information, let's look at what kind of countermeasures uh, software developers are given. So if, if this, for example, is how we would implement an end operation, so a simple end operation where you have A and B equals Y. In your Boolean masking scheme, you would end up doing a 10-step program. And you would split your initial values A and B into two shares, we call them. A1 and A2, B will be split in two shares, B1 and B2. And then there is an, an algorithm which is theoretically secure you can prove that this is theoretically secure, it will output two shares again, and if you XOR those two shares together, it will produce the correct output. When a mathematician writes down these algorithms, he will prove that these are secure. And now, and now I'm gonna say one more sentence, under the assumption that um, each of these instructions leak separately. So he's going to assume that this instruction on the line three is not going to interact with any other values on any of the other lines, for example. So that's the assumption that these uh, proofs are written. So now let's see what really happens when you implement this on a processor. Let's look at uh, line six and seven. I have two elements on the right hand side, that, two elements of uh, operations that will go into the right hand side of my ALU. And the value that goes in first, um, if you look at, it, it will go into that, for example, in that register that was in, uh, at the beginning of the ALU. The next one that will go into the ALU will overwrite that value at the register. If you look at the statistical properties of the overwrite of those two elements, you'll see that it, it is not independent of one of the inputs. If, one of, if that input was secret, then the power consumption will be uh, giving us some information about that input. And while that algorithm was theoretically secure because of the way the, um, the processor is working, suddenly it's, it will leak, right? Um, and so there, there are more of these types of leaks within that one algorithm. So now I have a couple of choices. I can either rewrite the whole algorithm and, and with the knowledge in mind how the microarchitecture of the whole processor is working, I, I can do that. But then imagine I would have to go to another processor. I would have to rewrite maybe the whole, arg uh, the whole algorithm because the architecture might have changed. Plus, it, it's going to be really hard to capture all the leaks in there. It, it's just an impossible task, basically. And so while we were um, designing a new processor anyway, Right. We, we can all start from scratch. We were thinking like, how can we make the life of a software developer who has to implement side channel secure implementations a little bit easier? Creating uh, side channel secure software implementations as if you don't know the exact hardware is going to be very hard. And you need to do a lot of testing because 
as you cannot sum up all the properties or all the possible places where the leak is going to happen, you will need to test it in, in real life. And so there, it's, uh, it takes, it's time consuming. So our idea was to create a transparent hardware protection layer such that the software developer does not need to take care about TPA anymore. Basically, he can write unprotected software and um, like magically it will be DPA hardened or to a certain uh, level. And the software developer can be mostly un unknowledgeable about the topic. He, uh, there are some trade-offs we needed to do, so eventually in the end, the software developer still needs to be a little bit aware, but he doesn't need to be writing any uh, DPA protected uh, code anymore. We started with a custom risk five design with the five pipeline stages. And we added some features to counteract side channel analysis. We introduced a random number generator. Uh, we masked, uh, we used masking to protect the whole data path and the register bank. And we also protected the memory access because that's also like an important uh, leakage. So here is our architecture overview. Yeah, this is a, a schematic overview of the processor. Basically, our register ma file we doubled, so we can always work with mask data. One, one part stores the one share, the other part stores the other share. Um, the memory is, is masked. Uh, it comes in uh, masked and we can calculate um, when it, it will go through the um, data pass, which is processing the two shares. And the LU uses state-of-the-art provable secure masking techniques to, reduce, to get rid of all the, all the leakage. Um, for the memory, so like doubling a register bank is still somewhat acceptable. If you're gonna, going to uh, double the amount of memory you're going to need, that's a little bit harder. So we made a little bit of a, a compromise there. We decided that we would use some sort of memory encryption with an on-the-fly session key calculation. And um, the session keys are a function of a random seat and the memory address. Uh, as a software developer, here is where you need to give some input. You can at least choose from two um, available session keys, which means that you can change the way your value is masked. So if you're writing something to a certain address and you're overwriting it something, you will need to change your session key, otherwise you will create an overwrite leak again. So there is still some knowledge to be to the implementation. And session keys can be updated via dedicated control status register. So that's how we still have some interaction from the software developer to the hardware, the underlying hardware. So we implemented this and then we tested it. Um, quickly, how do we test this? Uh, as I explained in the beginning, any data dependent leakage um, or has the potential to reveal secrets. So intuitively, if I can distinguish between a power consumption trace where I input one input or I um, compute with another input, I should not be able to distinguish this in the, in the power consumption domain. And then you take a lot of these measurements to reduce the noise in the system. And eventually, if you have clean traces and you compare those and you use statistical techniques to see whether any differences are um, statistically significant, then we can test these in a fairly quick manner. The statistical significance measurement is done by the Welsh T test for the ones who are interested in this. Our final implementation, we implemented this on the Zinc board where we had a, implemented a DPA hardened risk 5 uh, communication. So we had to send inputs to there. It goes through the UART and the ARM, which is on the Zinc board. And the communication happened between the shared memory. We use a probe to measure on top of the risk 5 unit, um, measure the, the electromagnetic radiation in this in this way, and then we process them all on the computer. This is how it looks in real life. And then these are sort of the results, so I'll show you. On top you'll see an AES operation. It's an unprotected AES implementation, so it's, it's just like how you would implement it if you would implement it in a non-DPA 
secure way. You can count around, it's one, AS 128. On the bottom, you'll see the difference between the fixed input and a random input uh, over a lot of measurements. These are like one million measurements. So after one million measurements, you reduce the noise of the one set and the other set, you compare the difference. And you'll see here um, that difference. You'll also see those threshold lines I spoke about in the previous slide. Uh, under that line, you have a very, very large, um, well, you know for sure that, it's, that there is no statistical relevant leak. You'll see input leaks, which are still on mass in this case, and output leaks. Um, so the input and the output are leaking, proving that it's working, and everything in between basically doesn't show any data dependent leakage. So this is after a couple of million traces. This is what it looks like if you would just implement an AES on an unprotected risk five. And this is only like a 15,000 traces. My, the same lines I had shown here in the previous slide, these 4.5 lines in the next slide here, they're, they're, very, they're like very tiny because these leaks are, are huge. And I'll throw in another algorithm. This is like a SHA-2 implementation. The same thing, you see the SHA-256 on the top slide. The average power consumption, if you want, you can count all rounds there. Here is the average trace of the inputs being fixed and input being random, the significance levels of 4.5. And you'll see again your input leaks and your output leaks. Okay, so basically what we did, we, is we implemented the DPA hardened core uh, with the idea that the software implementer can now write unprotected implementations and still achieve first order DPA security in a fairly easy, easy manner. Which then means that if you don't want to uh, invest in like area or something to protect, to put, a, put in a DPA protected uh, hardware core, for example, you can run it on the, on the RISC-V core and you can, you have the flexibility to choose which algorithm you run. So that was the idea. Voila. <laughs>